the Beale Lecture for 2014. Um, actually, this is the first time uh, we've ventured to run a separate Beale Lecture. Previously, it's been part of the, uh, the main conference. And uh, I, mean, I think this is a real opportunity to celebrate some of the successes in operational research and to celebrate some of our... Our oh, first speaker is... Uh, is Richard Wood from, well, at the time that he won the PhD prize, which I will tell you a little of in a moment, uh, he was at Cardiff University where he completed his PhD, but Richard is now working at the, the Lloyds Banking Group uh, here in London. Uh, Richard won the award for the best PhD dissertation, in fact, in uh, 2011. Um, his uh, this award is given for the most distinguished body of research that leads to the award of a, a PhD. And if I just read some of the comments from the external examiner, um, the, the examiner commented that the new insights developed in the thesis, thesis are impressive and that the work has had a major impact on the function of a hospital unit. Working closely alongside hospital staff during the PhD helped to ensure that the model would be used and be to the benefit of the hospital's organisation. An external examiner, and having been an external examiner many times myself, I can't always say this, but he found it a pleasure to read the PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> and the awards panel overall were extremely uh, impressed with the type of research, the appropriate theory that was used, and the fact that the PhD solved a practical problem. So without any, any further discussion, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Wood, who's going to talk on modelling activities at a neurological rehabilitation unit. Just to say, because we're, we're fairly short of time today, uh, Richard's going to talk for about 25 minutes. Um, we'll have time for a couple of questions, but uh, if you want to talk to Richard further, we've organised for tea and coffee af at the end of the two uh, lectures, and there'll be a chance to ask him uh, questions personally at that point. Okay, over to you, Richard. Right, yeah, thank you very much, here. Um, and yeah, start by saying it's an uh, absolute pleasure to be here today and um, being successful in the PhD award of 2011 um, was um, probably the greatest achievement uh, for me so far. Um, and being able to have the opportunity to present you an overview of my work is, is really great. Um, so, uh, um, so this started about five, uh, five years ago when I started my PhD. Um, at the time, I uh, had really a, a blank sheet of paper. Um, we knew we were going to be doing some work with Rookwood Hospital, uh, which is uh, the um, major uh, neuro rehabilitation unit for Wales, based in Cardiff. And um, we didn't really know exactly what uh, we would be doing and what methods we would be taking and what kind of results we'd be getting at the end of it. Um, so this kind of had, um, uh, this was a kind of blessing and a curse really. Um, that, um, I mean the lack of research in the <coughs> rehabilitation from a modelling perspective meant that there was not um, much existing work to go on and build on. Um, but it also meant we had half lunch to do whatever we wanted and go down whichever routes uh, we saw fit without having to worry about <coughs> has someone done this before and so on. Um, okay, so I'll start then with um, a bit about just um, your rehabilitation and, and <coughs> um, So we're looking at patients with acquired brain injury. Um, this can be traumatic, um, such as a, a car crash. Um, or non-traumatic, um, such as tumour, MS, epilepsy. Um, so this is an injury to the brain that's occurred since birth, sometime in the adult life. Um, the typical patient pathway for these uh, patients uh, would usually be a presentation at A&E at a district general, and then transfer to a specialist neurological ward in the district general hospital, sometimes for an intensive care unit. Um, after a stay of maybe a couple of months, a few weeks, um, at a district general, um, patients then, um, well, some of the patients at least, are transferred to um, a specialist rehabilitation unit where they stay for a number of months undergoing rehabilitation um, uh, and with the eventual outcome of either going back to home 
or getting some kind of long term care, such as nursing home, stuff like that. Okay, so Rookwood Hospital then, um, so it's based in, in Cardiff, it's the National Rehabilitation Unit for Wales, um, along with uh, a, there's another hospital in Swansea, I believe, but Cardiff Rookwood is, is the main one for, for all of Wales. Um, treatment's provided by a number of teams, the largest of which is physiotherapy, and um, there are some, also some occupational therapists, um, psychologists, dietitians, uh, so on. Um, so the uh, annual demand um, for this unit is about three four hundred. Uh, that's looking at, at figures for um, for instance um, of, of uh, brain injuries across the UK. Um, uh, there's about twenty one beds at at the hospital, um, and the average ever stay is five months. Um, so this means that the uh, annual throughput is about 50 patients per year. So this is, is less, much less than the demand, so it's highly sought out, sought out to service. Uh, it's also expensive, and this means that it's a, a, a prime candidate for mathematical modelling and operational research, uh, to try and increase uh, efficiencies and so on. Okay, um, so modelling this this hospital um, using the queuing theory, um, so this is a kind of very basic um, picture of the queuing uh, process at the <coughs> hospital. And um, so a, a kind of basic um, example of a kind of single um, uh, single uh, queue with multiple service channels is something like a post office where customers arrive, they wait in the queue, there's a number of servers, when there's an available server, uh, they then join uh, their service. Um, so that's the case, similar case here. Um, instead we have uh, referrals waiting in, in the queue and um, the actual patient is waiting at the hospital, uh, wherever that might be in the district general. And when the bed becomes available at the hospital, um, then they're there, then transferred. Okay, so they enter one of the, the 21 beds and um, when uh, they're ready to be discharged, they, uh, they leave the unit. Um, so, if just looking at this in a very simple, simplistic way to begin with, um, we assume that the uh, length of stay um, is exponentially distributed, um, with the average of about five months, and the um, inter-arrival time of referrals is about uh, 2.75 days, so it's about uh, two and a half referrals per week there. Um, this is um, a well-known NMC view. So we have random arrivals, um, exponentially distributed service time. There's 21 service channels there. The um, problem is this is too simplistic for the hospital. A major um, uh, uh, aspect of this work was incorporating delays to discharge. So um, essentially when a patient is ready to be discharged, they sometimes remain at the facility for uh, a longer amount of time just was social services carrying out improvements to their home or the nursing home or whatever the discharge destination just needs to make things ready for, for their arrival. Um, so we separate length of stay into active and blocked. Um, active being the time for which they're undergoing meaningful uh, rehabilitation if you like um, when uh, they're actually uh, improving and then once they are, are ready for discharge they're into a blocked phase which is a um, essentially where just, um, uh, their, their kind of condition is being maintained whilst they're waiting for discharge. Um, so for active length of stay, I uh, use a coxine based type distribution. Um, so those familiar with queuing theory will be aware that you can't just put in any distribution um, uh, the analytics um, require uh, something of it, something uh, usually exponential, some um, derogation of an exponential distribution to allow just tractability. Um, so the coxine distribution is basically a, a mark of chain with a load of exponential distributions lined up where we look at different um, uh, transfers through that kind of stage of exponential distributions. Um, okay. um, 
Also, to make things a little bit more complicated, um, <coughs> we've um, incorporated bulking and reneging. Um, this is basically just to align the model with what actually goes on in real life. Um, not all patients who join the queue will eventually actually see uh, a service at the hospital. Um, and um, uh, so we have demand, and some of those will just see the size of the queue, and the, the hospital will say, no, this, this patient isn't going to go there and send them somewhere else. So that's bulking. When eight years when the patients, the referrals join the queue, but then sometime um, through the wait, uh, they either get transferred somewhere, or die, or whatever reason, they, they leave the queue. And so that's when they go. And then the final kind of complication there is that not all patients are the same. And if we just have this model, we would say that the length of stay for patients is, is uh, homogeneous in, in, in fact, all patients are, are treated are treated and modeled as, as similar. Um, and this is just isn't the case. Um, patients' different age, uh, gender, um, the way in which they're admitted, this can all actually um, affect the length of stay uh, at the unit. So to take this into account, basically partition the system up. Um, so we have, um, here we have a number of different queuing systems, and each one is for a different patient group. Um, so we partition 21 beds up into a number of, of groups, such that the beds, total number of beds within all of those groups total is 21. Okay. Um, so it is in cartel, as this is a classification regression tree, and stuff just to work out those patient groups. So average number of stay is about 150 days. Um, but by branching um, on a number of variables, the aim of which is to reduce variance and find um, a number of homogeneous groups, um, we get about 20% reduction in variance by branching uh, twice here. Okay, and you see that the uh, level of stay there is, is rather different um, in each group. Um, then fit the coxine distribution, phase of distribution to the active level of stay for each of those groups and an exponential distribution to the block that is say for each of those groups, um, such that the um, mean active number stay, block number stay, totals the, um, uh, the aggregate number stay. So for patient group one, <coughs> the 86 days is composed of 72 days of actual meaningful rehabilitation, and then an average delay of 14 days whilst they await transfer. Okay, so the queuing system now looks something like this. And looking at through present previous data, we're able to say how many um, beds are allocated to each of the patient groups. So of the 21 beds, we've got six beds allocated to patient group one, uh, so on three for patient groups two and three, and nine beds for patient group four. Um, I think the uh, three branching variables were um, uh, discharge destination, um, diagnosis, and admission source. Okay, so what do we actually require from the system? Um, First of all, steady state results, um, so the probability of the system being in any state at any time. Steady state is a prick here because we're talking about long term, so we're not looking for transient results, such as in a doctor surgery or an accident and emergency ward where, uh, where you need to account for kind of a warm up period each day. This is a kind of long term uh, time frame here, so it's, it's steady state results we're after. Um, also, performance measure measures, um, cost analysis, so on, and that will be useful for eventual what if analysis, which is the, the main uh, um, kind of, um, purpose of these efforts. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the solution of that um, Yeah, I'll, basically it's um, uh, set up as a continuous time mark of chain. It's a truly analytical solution um, based on um, setting up, automatically setting up a system with how many beds, how many phases in each of the distributions and solving it by, I think it was Maple and Matlab. Um, but this is a, a generic approach and a generic solution. Um, so we can enter in whatever components of the system, hit a button and it'll give us the results. Um, so the results then, um, the left, uh, the graph on, on the left is the total number of referrals and patients in, in the system. So you'll see the probability density is, is, is above 20, indicating that 
um, the unit is, is always full. Um, you'll see from the mean bed occupancy of 20.8 patients that that is the case. There's all to queue at this facility. Uh, the mean queue level is about 10 referrals, and the mean waiting time is about a month. Um, the annual cost then is uh, looking at the number of patients the bed costs per day, per day as well, etc. is about three and a half million. Okay, you'll also see probability of reneging, so that's <coughs> it's actually a 60% chance that if you join the queue, you won't make it through uh, to the unit. So that's really quite large. And these will vary to get on the step against data. <coughs> so what if analysis then? Um, so uh, the original results on the left there. So the first kind of what if analysis, we say what happens if we can reduce delays of discharge? So the block level of stay, if we just reduce that, what happens? So if we reduce the block level of stay by 50%, we get um, quite a sizable decrease in the probability of reneging. Um, a big increase in the annual throughput, so more patients are actually um, gaining access to this service. Um, also, a slight reduction in the annual cost, so that's, that's good. Um, we can also look at things like um, what happens with an aging population. So, we increase the arrival rate, so we do a cart analysis um, by age, split by age, and then say, let's increase the arrival rate of older patients. How does this impact? Obviously, it makes, makes things worse. We've got uh, Larger than anything, more costs, etc. Um, another kind of handle of the unit is the number of beds, so they can increase or decrease the number of beds. Um, so, as you can see from the top next to this, well, basically, as you increase the number of beds, it gets more costly, but a better service for patients, as, as you'd imagine. Um, so, these are quite useful, but they don't, um, only one of these really um, relates to an actual handle of the unit, so, um, and that's the number of beds. Um, Reducing the delays of discharge, we can't exactly say how that could be brought about. And one of the most useful things in this model would be if we can say how can uh, how can we um, actually achieve the kind of scenarios that we're we're analysing, we're getting results for. Um, right. So one of the big um, uh, things that impact length of stay is treatment intensity. So if you provide more therapy to patients they recover quicker. Uh, this has been the uh, conclusion of a number of studies. Um, so how do we incorporate this within the model? Um, so the service rates, they relate to the number of states. And each of the distributions within the queuing system, um, if we can, meet, if we can uh, set the service rates, the actual um, parameters of those distributions to be dependent on the length of stay, then we have incorporated this within within the system. Okay, so just going back to the queuing system there. So if we look in detail then at the active length of stay component of a patient, arbitrary patient group. Um, so as it stands, we just have a coxian based off distribution for that, um, looking something like that. And from that we look, we've got a distribution of uh, probabilities of obtaining different levels of stays. Um, so we get, we get a mean of variance from this, etc. Um, so to incorporate treatment intensity, partition that into firstly a graph that just gives a central estimate. Um, so this is a relationship between treatment intensity and the active length of stay. Um, so this shows that if you increase treatment intensity, you reduce you reduce the length of stay. To incorporate to allow for the variation then. Um, we have a similar graph to the one on the left, so a coxian distribution, but where the active level states when the rates are actually scaled by the result of the mid graph there. So whatever treatment intensity we provide, we get a corresponding active level stay, and then we scale the distribution on the right accordingly. Okay, um, treatment intensity, um, so the amount of therapy received each week can be directly controlled by the units. It is, um, in fact, a product of the treatment timetables. So, at Brookwood Hospital and in the rehabilitation hospitals, they have a treatment timetable each week that is based on uh, uh, demand, um, supply, etc., of therapy sessions. Um, so, Brookwood is no different, they have a treatment timetable um, uh, in which demand is set for each patient. Um, so, each week, the Therapists go around and say this patient needs X number of sessions next week, um, and the supply is determined by the availability of staff, 
and indeed the skill mix of staff, and the uh, department fits the demand to the supply. Uh, there's always an excess demand, there's always more, uh, more demand for treatment than there is supply. So the aim here is to automate the scheduling process that was currently, uh, well at the time, undertaken all by hand, a completely manual process. Um, and we thought if we can automate this, then we can rapidly evaluate the effects of changes to the skill mix, um, availability of staff, and patient demand and availability on the average treatment intensities from each patient group. Um, and we're going to do too much detail. Uh, the unit was very familiar with Excel, so built this using VBA, um, involved some heuristics, uh, some common meta heuristics. Um, but I'll skip a complete uh, summary of that. Um, so then go back to the relationship between treatment intensity and length of stay. So we have for the patient groups um, some data on this. Not a great deal of data because there's not great throughput of this hospital. Um, but we have some data and we have fitted 1 over x type relations to this data. Um, and we've constrained this by the known length of stay for each of patient groups and the known treatment intensity for each of the groups. And then what we do is we vary the treatment timetable, so change for us, change for skill mix, maybe increase the number of therapists, press the, the run button, that spits out treatment intensities for each of the patient group, average treatment intensities. Then we see by the patient group four, if treatment intensity has increased, we look at the resulting decrease in, in the length of stay and then we parameterize the model um, rescale the service rates in the distributions of the queuing system model and then uh, solve the system for the uh, various performance measures. So I'll just give a couple of examples then. Um, so one of the examples <coughs> looked at was, um, one of the scenarios looked at was more group sessions. So typically the department um, provided a lot of one-to-one -one sessions, um, but we want to look at um, what happens if you provide more group sessions? So one member of staff, but maybe a couple of, of, of patients. Um, so the, form, the formula was um, amend the schedule, run the programme, find the average length of stay based on, on that um, uh, new setup, solve the system, and this gave us a result that we would have um, three extra patients per year, um, a reduction in, in waiting time, and reduced number of patients actually going elsewhere and leaving the queue. That's a good thing. Um, also, looked at in light of budget cuts were uh, composition of the workforce. Um, now, there was a, 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 a possible view that reducing the number of, um, sorry, retaining the number of full time equivalents, but reducing the kind of balance of those, so skewing towards lower balance, was an option to reduce costs. So, we used the um, model to actually evaluate this, and it turns out that doing this, um, uh, doesn't really impact um, that well um, uh, the, um, uh, the service to the patients. Um, what actually happens is it leads to a lower treatment intensity because um, the lower band staff can't actually lead sessions. So we find that these lower band staff aren't, aren't much uh, uh, aren't much use in um, providing the sessions for the patients. So we have wasted resources then, long enough for stay. Um, you know, we have idle hours where staff aren't, aren't doing anything, um, fewer patients per year. Okay. So, also, um, uh, a kind of spin off um, from this work was um, the scheduling programme. And we originally set this up just to um, look at uh, uh, being able to look at the effects of um, changes to the school mix, changes to the number of staff, and so on. Um, basically trying to replicate the manual process of scheduling treatment by hand. Um, but it became um, clear that the automated scheduling program was um, perhaps a, a, a decent replacement for the by hand approach. Um, so we started trying this at the end of 2010, and in early 2011, um, we started using this in the hospital as a way of scheduling treatment each week. Um, before it took about eight hours each week for a um, for a school physiotherapist um, to sit down with a sheet of paper, uh, a 
blank timetable and a sheet with all of their demands for each of the patients, how many sessions they wanted, what times, etc. Also another sheet saying what staff were on the roster for that week and they had to try and fit that demand to the supply on, on the timetables. So this, this was an arduous task, it took a long time. Um, there were also political things like, oh, uh, I don't want to work with that person or this therapist will not want to work with so and so. Um, so doing it with a computer kind of alleviates those problems. Um, so af afterwards, um, so uh, once the scheduled programme was, was in effect, um, there's more time for clinical work. Basically it took less hours to actually set up and run. Um, uh, I think it was at least four hour saving each week. Um, some weeks could take as little as one or two hours to do, so we're saving basically a whole day of um, employee time that could be spent seeing patients. Um, also a better solution, so on the right hand side, um, objective function value, I haven't got time to um, talk about exactly what constituents is, is, that is composed of, um, but it's, it's on a number of measures we um, determined that the solution obtained by the computer programme was a lot better than when it was done by hand. <coughs> Um, just because of the huge amounts of permutations you can get with all of the sessions. Um, so things like getting an equal, even spacing through the week. Um, you don't want all of the sessions on one day, and space them out. Um, there's about the same um, uh, demanded session schedule. That's just basically because um, you've only got limited capacity. Yeah. Um, but what it did succeed in, one of the things it did succeed in doing was um, ensuring an allocation, an increased allocation to the, to the patient's primary or secondary physiotherapist. So instead of just um, assigning it to um, uh, any other therapist, the um, program meant that, um, the use of the program meant that more patients were actually being seen by their primary physio, which is a good thing. Um, also, we were able to get performance measures from this and it streamlined the audit process. As before, they had to do all of these sheets with uh, pencil, done my pencil and so on, and had to somehow convert that into um, summary measures for, for audit. This program, um, I worked with the clinicians to decide what kind of things they want coming out of it, and coded it up so that it just gave them an uh, Excel document or whatever at the end of it, saying all of the, the measures for that week. Okay, and this, these are just a few comments on the work from um, Jakob Greus, who was um, superintendent uh, physiotherapist at time. Um, so yeah, without saying as well, um, this, this work really wouldn't have happened. Um, it was really great and allowed um, us a lot of access to different therapists and members of staff at the unit. Um, also, of course, grateful for all the therapists and, and nurses and so on at the unit who helped in this work. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Two questions at this point, if anybody <coughs> to ask. I was wondering why the grenadine rate reduced. Can you explain what? that? Why the grenadine reduced? Yeah. So grenadine is is yeah when um, so percentage so I think it was about sixty two percent originally. So I was saying 62% of patients um, who join the queue would not see service, would not actually go to the hospital. Um, so which sorry, scenario was it where it reduced? I don't recall where it was because the complaint of the service changed. Yeah. So um, so in, in, in when we evaluated scenarios where um, uh, numbers stay reduced, so if you increase the therapy intensity, so bringing more staff, therapy intensity increases, length of stay reduces. That means that you can get more patients through each year. So that increases the throughput on the unit. And that has an effect on the number of patients, the waiting list time, the waiting list is reduced, the waiting time is reduced because of that. That means that more patients get through, less patients actually go off and, and do whatever, and go get transferred before they actually end the service. So the relating is, is it's basically to do with dependent on the length of time spent in the queue. And if it's too long, then patients will find other, uh, other places to go. Okay, um, so you 
you raised the gun. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think it's fantastic. I just want to say, I think it's fantastic. How, if, how transferable is it to other, either neurological rehabilitation units, or indeed other therapeutic settings or, or hospital settings? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, um, in your rehabilitation, there, there's, there's not a lot of um, modelling work going on. Um, I found maybe one or two very small studies um, on the modelling work, and that was mainly in scheduling rather than actually modelling holistically the, the hospital. Um, so I think for neuro rehabilitation facilities, it's, it's got potential to be extended. And um, I mean, one of, one of the, the things is you can't just take us and plonk into any unit. Um, there's a number of um, uh, small things each different unit has that could, you know, would have to be tweaked. But um, for neuro rehabilitation, yeah, um, for, for other units, I think it would be great to see a similar approach or this approach on table. Um, a lot of the work I formed the, the basis of the literature review was from geriatric um, studies. There's been a, a great deal of, of research in, in geriatric care and modelling patient flows in that. And um, there's, uh, I mean, it's a similar kind of setup. Patients arrive, they need long-term care. It's not just an accident emergency or a two-day thing. And the patients then go to social services. So that kind of two-stage process is inherent, is, is inherent there as well. Um, so yeah, I think um, it has got a uh, scope to be used in other, in other areas, especially the blocks that the state and that's, uh, that's quite a useful um, component to have for the model. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. I'm going to, I'm, the sign of a great talk is lots of questions, uh, but time won't and letters. Uh, Richard, is uh, you'll be available afterwards, yeah, course, so yeah. I think if people have further questions to ask Richard, uh, uh, after the uh, after the event, so thank you very much, Richard. Okay.